Welcome, everyone. This is a primary source webinar on Chinese philosophy in world history and the world today. I'm Peter Gilmartin, a program director at Primary Source. Primary Source is a 26-year-old nonprofit organization that works to advance global education in schools. We believe in the power of understanding the world from diverse perspectives and in a future in which all individuals are in Formed and contributing global citizens. This session takes us to ancient East Asia, where Confucianism, Taoism, and legalism profoundly impacted human society. We will consider how students can learn to appreciate the relevance of these philosophies not only to ancient China, but to a wider world and to contemporary life. Our presenting scholar today is Michael Pewitt, Professor of Chinese History and Chair of the Committee on the Study of Religion at Harvard University. I want to express my appreciation to Michael for coming back again as he's presented frequently for Primary Source. After he presents, Todd Witten, Head of the History Department at Burlington High School, will discuss Chinese philosophy in the classroom. Finally, this will be followed by a opportunity for our participants to ask questions and for Michael and Todd to respond. Now, without further ado, let me turn the controls over to Michael. And thank you again, Michael, for presenting. Thank you so much, Peter. And let me immediately ask, am I coming through clearly? Can you hear me well? Yeah, I think you're doing, you're pretty clear there, Michael. Okay, great. If anybody has a problem okay. hearing Michael, maybe you can say so in the chat box. Please do. So I can see the chat box, so please do let me know. Um, oh, I, I do see from Charlotte it uh, is a bit fuzzy. Um, is this better? I'm moving a little bit closer to the microphone. Um, how, how is this? Is this a little bit better now? Well, I'll keep talking so that way you can, you can let me know. So far this seems to be, oh, still a bit fuzzy. Let me move it a little bit closer. A little bit better. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm, okay, good, good. So it looks like this is much better. So if at any point it's less good, um, if you'd like me to speak louder, um, if I'm speaking too loudly, please do again, just note in the chat box and I can see it clearly on my screen and I can move accordingly. So thank you all so much. And let me begin with a huge thanks to Peter for all of his work in putting this together, to Stephanie, who's been so helpful in a lot of the organizational work, and to primary source at a larger level. Primary source has been doing an extraordinary job for years now in helping to bring East Asian materials and now materials from around the world into the classroom. It has been an honor to work with you all, my deep thanks. And a huge thanks to all of you, the teachers, for being involved in this. You, of course, are doing the crucial work in actually bringing this material to our students. And the work you're doing down the road, I guarantee you will have an extraordinary impact we can help to create the world that primary source has been hoping to, where ideas from around the world are just part of what students grow up knowing and thinking, we will help to create a very, very different world down the road. So my deep thanks to all of you. Now, as Peter mentioned, um, what tonight we'll be talking about is Chinese philosophy um, in histor its historical past and in the contemporary period. We also will be doing so from a pedagogical perspective. In other words, how can we actually introduce some of these ideas into the classroom? And it's a tremendous honor to be here with Todd, who's been doing a huge amount of work in this precise goal. And so I will begin with a brief statement about some of these ideas. We'll then turn things over to Todd, who will talk explicitly about the pedagogical sides of this. And then, as Peter mentioned, we'll then open it up for a larger discussion, um, both about the ideas and the pedagogy, I'm trying to think through how we can help bring these ideas to life. Now, to introduce these ideas, let me begin just by mentioning a few broad ideas that we won't be talking about. And what I mean by that is the following. If we were doing this web chat, say, 50 years ago, well, it wouldn't have been a web chat to begin with, um, but the ideas also would have been quite different. So 50 years ago, if someone were speaking about Confucianism, Taoism, and legalism in history and today. 
you probably would have gotten a narrative something along the following lines. Well, Confucianism, Taoism, and legalism were part of the philosophies of traditional China. They all taught people basically to learn to live in the world properly as they were told. So Confucianism, according to this way of thinking, would have been a philosophy telling people, follow your social roles and do them well, and that's your life goal. And Taoism would have been read as a philosophy saying, yeah, that's true, but then on weekends, go out and enjoy nature and accept that the world is harmonious and live to finally follow your goals. There, of course, the Confucians are saying, but live also well according to the proper harmony of the universe. And the legalists then would have been read as saying, yeah, all of that's fine and good, but we also need a really strong authoritarian state so that if people don't follow the rules properly and don't do what they're told, then we'll have this authoritarian state that can control them very, very properly. And part of that narrative would have also continued that, yeah, all of that is true, and that is what led to China being a very powerful big empire with these very authoritarian philosophies behind it, but it's also in the long run what prevented China from becoming a properly modern world. It, it prevented it from developing capitalism, individualism, creativity, democracy, and therefore what China had to do nowadays, again, we're mid 20th century, is break from this traditional past, modernize, and finally become a good modern world. And so basically these philosophies would have been read as things that told people what to do, kept people in their place, and fortunately now is being destroyed as China modernizes. Well, here we are 50 years later, and um, our narrative is going to have to change. Suddenly these philosophies, these old traditional ideas, are coming back, and they're looking a lot different from the way they were being portrayed 50 years ago. And meanwhile, we're also doing tons of new excavations, finding tons of new texts from ancient China. And suddenly a lot of these ideas are looking very different than we thought <laughs> they were. And moreover, we're doing tons of historical research about what happened between that ancient period and what's going on now. And a lot of the history of China, and indeed, frankly, all of East Asia, was also looking very different. And so through these excavations, through this historical research, and through this contemporary resurgence, suddenly we're going through a reevaluation of much of what we thought we knew. And so my goal tonight will be to introduce you to a bit of this, introduce you to what we're now learning about these ideas, what we're now learning about their role in Chinese and indeed East Asian history, and part of what is going on right now with their current resurgence. And throughout, our question will be, how can we help to teach this in the classroom in ways that will bring these ideas alive to our students? So a lot to talk about, but the ideas are so exciting that I think it will, it will carry us through very successfully. So let's begin with this. In front of you is simply a map. It's a map of China, but, but you, know, you can see from even this, this map that China is part of a much larger world called Eurasia. And let's begin our narrative in a not arbitrary place, we'll see. Let's say something around 1200 to 1000 BCE. Um, if you're looking at, as we are now, at China, but frankly, if you're looking across Eurasia, you would look at basically a similar type of society going on pretty much across the board. So in all the agriculture, cultural areas of Eurasia at this time, basically you've got all land being controlled by an hereditary elite. So these are aristocratic societies. They control all land, all resources. The politics of almost all of these societies across Eurasia simply consist of the most powerful aristocratic family controlling the rulership. Um, that rulership continues in that aristocratic family until they begin to lose power when they do, then another aristocratic family takes over. And basically the politics consist of various aristocratic powers controlling huge swaths of land, vying for power amongst themselves as to who the ruler will be. If you're looking at material culture, you would also see lots of similarities. Um, 
technologies are diffusing across Eurasia, even this early. So all of these are what we call Bronze Age societies, because the major metal being used is bronze, an alloy of tin and copper. Um, by this point, chariot warfare has spread throughout Eurasia, so all the aristocrats would ride chariots and when they go to war. Um, basically, riding is, is part of the part and parcel of, of what the educated elite are using to rule these, these states. And so if you're an alien looking across your Asia around this time, that's basically what you're seeing. Now, there are variations. So each of these areas has particularly – oh, it, it, it sounds like I'm getting fuzzy again. So let me move a little bit closer. Is this better now if I move right here to the microphone? Okay, it sounds like that's a little bit better. So yes, thank you so much for letting me know, and, and please continue to do so. Oh, and it's still fuzzy. Okay, how about this? Is this – this I'm now moving where I think the microphone should be. Is this doing a little bit better? Okay, it sounds like this is doing a little bit better. Great, thank you so much, and please do continue to let me know as, as, as I <laughs> either fade in or fade out. Great, thank you so much. So if you're now looking at different parts of Eurasia, you see a few variations. Um, so what we're looking at here is one of the things that's very important in China at the time, um, which is a bronze vessel. So these are vessels that are used to give sacrifices to the ancestors. These are, again, aristocratic families who are giving sacrifices to their ancestors. And one of the peculiarities of China is simply that there's a lot of tin and copper, so they make incredible bronze vessels. So one of the variations of the material culture are an unbelievable array of these stunning bronze vessels, really, I think, among the best in, in all of world history. Stunning. And you see a few other variations, too, um, some of which will be quite important. So in China, yes, the politics consist of various aristocratic groups vying for power. Um, they have one ideology that's, that's a little bit unique. So the way they will put it in China, beginning by at least 1000 BC, maybe earlier, but our first extant records, about 1000 BC, they have an argument called the Mandate of Heaven, which will hold that Yes, different aristocratic families vie for power, but what's really going on according to the theory of the mandate of heaven is that heaven is a moral ruler, and that moral ruler will declare a given aristocratic family to hold the rulership on moral grounds. So a ruler will take the throne because he is good. That throne then stays in the family, father to son, as long as the family continues to be good, if they ever cease to be moral, which tends to happen every two to three hundred years, um, they will lose the throne, and heaven will grant the mandate to the next most moral person in the realm, and then the throne will go to that family. And so the argument is, it isn't simply aristocratic families vying for power, it's based upon a moral element. So it's the most moral family in the realm that will always be holding the throne. That theory, called the Mandate of Heaven, again, arises around 1000 BCE, um, but it seems to be part and parcel of what's going on across Eurasia. So, that's things around now 4000 BC. The reason I've actually been talking so long about this period is because then we get to a fundamental change. Over the next millennium, so moving into the first millennium BCE, Literally every single thing I just mentioned completely breaks down. Across all of Eurasia, these Bronze Age aristocratic states all are destroyed. Every single one of them collapses. We have the beginning of what we call now the Iron Age. Um, this is for the simple reason that the main metal used switches from being bronze to iron. But it's part and parcel of a much grander set of changes. So with the use of iron comes other things, too. Bronze is, again, an alloy of tin and copper. It is a very expensive, difficult alloy. It is part and parcel of an aristocratic culture. Peasants are not using bronze. They certainly are not making bronze vessels like we were just looking at. Um, it's an aristocratic metal. Iron, on the contrary, is a natural metal. It's all over the place. The technology needed is simply learning how to heat it high enough, you need incredible amounts of heat to work with iron, 
But once you've got that technology down, and that technology spreads throughout all of Eurasia very quickly, you can make iron implements easily and cheaply. You can, for example, make agricultural implements out of iron quickly, and they're incredibly powerful. Suddenly, you can have peasants in the field using iron plows. Suddenly, agricultural productivity begins to dramatically rise, as therefore does the population. You can also, of course, use iron for other things. If it's cheap and easy to, to use, and it is, you can also, for example, make lots of weapons. Bronze weapons are expensive. You give them to an aristocracy. Iron weapons are cheap and easy. You can give them to tons of people. And if you can train those people, you can start building mass infantry armies, which every single major agricultural state in Eurasia begins doing around this time. And once you're building mass infantry armies, you start promoting people based upon the degree to which they're good soldiers. If you do so, suddenly you begin to get social mobility. So you've got population growth, you have mass infantry armies beginning to promote social mobility, and then you start getting other things too, along with this huge population growth that you can use for mass infantry armies, you start getting cities being built because you have huge populations. And with cities become trade, which begins to emerge. And with trade, of course, begins mercantile activity, which means merchants start becoming wealthy. And you start getting social mobility through the acquisition of wealth as well. All of this population growth, the emergence of mass infantry armies, the dramatic rise of cities and trade, all of this creates a total collapse in these earlier aristocratic societies. All of them collapse. And as they collapse, all of the political ideologies associated with them also collapse. All the religions associated with them collapse. In fact, a lot of other collapses too. Once all of that begins collapsing, you start creating an sense, really for the first time in, say, 2,000 years, that other possibilities can begin to emerge too. It's a period of unbelievable cultural and social crisis. It's also a period when there's at least the possibility for change. It's a period of incredible political experimentation across Eurasia. This, of course, is the period when you get the rise of radical democracies in Greece, the Republic in Rome, and we'll see momentarily in China, very, very new types of political activity. It's the period when you also get the explosion of religious and philosophical ideas. All of these new religious and philosophical movements emerging in the collapse of these earlier Bronze Age religions. So, roughly the same time, it's when you get the Pre-Socratics, Plato, um, Aristotle in Greece. You get Jainism, the Buddha in India, roughly the same time. And yes, roughly the same time in China, Confucius, Lao Tzu, all of the major figures that we will later see as being the beginners of Confucianism, Taoism, and we'll see later, legalism, all roughly the same time. Let's go back to our alien. <laughs> if our alien, 1200 BCE to about 1000 BCE, sees Eurasia as basically being kind of the same with minor variations, now that same alien arrived in, say, 4th, 3rd century BCE, sees some similarities, um, massive cultural crises, all the things I just mentioned as being characteristic of Iron Age societies, but now the big differences are beginning. Yes, tons of political experimentation, but the nature of that experimentation begins to change. Tons of new religious movements, but the content of those movements are quite different. And here is one of the key moments when the different ass parts of Eurasia begin going in radically different directions. So let's then turn back to China. What you're looking at on the screen are actually bamboo strips. These are bamboo strips that we're finding now tons of through our excavations that are literally leading to a completely new understanding of what was going on at the time. They are 
all over the place. And what we're finding, I'm sure, is 0.00001% of what was actually circulating. A huge explosion of new ideas, new writings, theories about the self, the society, what sorts of political worlds we should build, new movements emerging all over the place. And let's turn to a few of these. The most important, of course, we know in retrospect, oh, and, and, and it sounds like I'm losing it again. Let me move in a little bit closer. How is this? Are you hearing me better now? Actually, yeah, oh, good. That is, sounds like that's a little bit better. Let me, and is this even better if I move it right here? Okay, good. It sounds a little bit better. Thank you so much for letting me know. So please continue to do so. So let us now turn to the content of these ideas. At the beginning of the lecture, I mentioned Confucianism, Taoism, Legalism, which we, I think, mistakenly 50 years ago were reading as basically ideologies teaching people to accept the world as it is, to follow their roles, accord with a harmonious larger universe, and accept an authoritarian state. Um, now they're beginning to look a little bit different. If you look now at what's going on, um, now that we're understanding things a little bit differently, actually all three of these, including even legalism, the most surprising I admit of the, of the three in terms of what I'm about to say, all three of these are really part and parcel of what's going on across your Asia. Basically attempts to create worlds in which Others, others than simply aristocrats, can flourish. Now, the three have very different ideas, but that's really the way to understand these. Now, that may seem very surprising, particularly with legalism, but let me explain why I'm putting it this way. If you actually look at these writings we have that will become the big Confucian writings, they're not about teaching people to follow proper roles. Um, we'll get later to why that occurs and how that interpretation develops. But if you look at the early movements in the first millennium BCE, basically what these early Confucian writings are about is trying to create a world in which people, if they cultivate themselves and if they become educated, can ideally create better worlds and more specifically, even become political leaders. The goal is to work toward creating some kind of meritocratic society in which those who are actually well-educated and cultivating themselves will move up, hopefully inspire those others to do the same, and the goal is really to try to create such a world. Now, yes, Confucianism is incredibly interested in things like, oh, okay, it sounds like the slides are coming through. Let me try to play with this a little bit. Are the slides coming through now? I should also add immediately, if the slides aren't coming through clearly, um, mainly the slides are to give you a sense of this material culture that we're getting through our excavations. So if you're not getting the slides clearly, you're not actually losing a lot of content. Or it sounds like the others can. Okay, it sounds like some of you are seeing them clearly and some of you aren't. Um, if you are, that's great. If you aren't, don't worry. You, you're getting no content in these images. These images are just trying to give you a sense of the material culture at the time. So. So many apologies for those who can't see them, but, but luckily you're not, you're not missing much. Now, getting back to Confucianism. So Confucianism is intimately concerned with following rituals and following roles, but it's very clear once you get into what Confucians are saying that their big interest isn't to say there are roles in life that you must simply follow. Rather, the big concern is self-cultivation. And the argument, in a nutshell, goes along the following lines. Minus any self-cultivation, minus ritual training, we human beings are in danger of simply becoming um, creatures who are kind of messy, who are largely guided by our emotions. And as creatures largely guided by our emotions, we will tend to simply interact with others around us in dangerous ways. And we can draw out each other's worst tendencies, our, our angers and jealousies and resentments. That's the danger. And minus anything we do, that's what we'll tend to become. And we will tend to fall into very rigid patterns, and those patterns can continue endlessly. 
and human society can completely rigidify. That's the concern. And so the hope in Confucianism is that what you're doing is trying to train people through rituals to break out of these dangerous patterns and train themselves to become better people. The focus is self-cultivation. The goal of rituals isn't to train you to do certain things. The idea of rituals is they train you to become better people. Um, I met my dad moving immediately to the pedagogical aspect of this, and I often tell my students, think of, to give a modern example of this, like when we train a child to say please and thanks at the dinner table. Um, the ritual, of course, is to say to a child, don't simply say, give me the salt. You're training a child to say, no, no, please give me the salt and say thank you when I give you the, the salt back. But of course, the reason we're doing that ritual isn't to create a ritual automaton who will always be saying please and thank you all the time. The ideal there is to try to create a world in which that child will gain a sense of what it means to ask something of another human being and to express gratitude in getting it back. And if you do the ritual well, the hope is as the child grows up, they'll realize you can't simply say please and thank you in every situation to, to create that proper sensibility. What you're trying to do with the ritual is train one's dispositions, in this case the child's dispositions of sensing other people, requesting something, expressing gratitude, and those dispositions by definition will have to be expressed in very different ways in very different situations. The argument of the Confucians is it's only through ritual training that you can actually train your dispositions to be able to sense situations well, to act appropriately, and only rituals will do that. So yes, they're intensely concerned with rituals, but the ideal isn't simply that you become a ritual automaton. The ideal is that from those you break into actually being able to sense situations well, act in ways that bring out the best in others, and hopefully, if you do this, then we would create a world where those people would ideally be able to actually run society and inspire the next generation as well. So the intense interest is self-cultivation, ritual training of dispositions, and ideally creating a meritocratic world. Now, if that's a very, very quick introduction to Confucianism, what about Taoism? Well, intriguingly, Taoism says much less than we tend to think about learning to accept the world as harmonious and adapt to it. The concern with Taoism is actually much more, if you say look at their examples of who they're talking about, they are people who are in society, living in society, living in society very well, in the sense of being very effective in society, but really the goal in computing Taoism as well, it's self-cultivation, but here not so much through ritual training. The argument is that ritual training can still restrict you too much. It's self-cultivation aiming to be able to actively work in the world to create different things for the better. Now, the focus is, in creating different things for the better, the focus is trying to act in ways that will give a proper sense of harmony to the world around you. And so you're training yourself to be able to sense situations, and that sounds very much like Confucianism, but in Taoism the focus is much more one of constant training, often breaking from rituals as necessary, but constant training to try to work beyond simply what they will perceive as an overly restrictive Confucian view of what self-cultivation means. So a lot of their examples will not simply be great people who become great rulers, as the Confucians, a lot of the Taoists will emphasize, well, anyone in any walk of life, simply through self-cultivation, trying to learn how to act in ways that will actually create better worlds for those around them. And so the examples will be cooks and wheelwrights, and people in all walks of life. But the reason I emphasize this is notice even with that example, um, the concern is again self-cultivation. And the focus is really how we can train ourselves to become better people, again, regardless of your birth, regardless of whether you happen to be born an aristocrat. And for all the differences between these, Confucianism and Taoism, they in this sense actually share quite a bit. 
It's all about self-cultivation, creating better people, breaking from our dangerous patterns, trying to create better worlds than the worlds in which we're born. Now, finally, legalism. <laughs> now, you might think legalism is the, at least at, <laughs> at the minimum the one of these three that does not fit this larger argument I'm giving. But all of these are part and parcel of this sort of pan-Eurasian movement toward creating different types of societies breaking out of these aristocratic worlds. Um, actually, even legalism fits this. Now, legalism is not about self-cultivation. It is not about helping people become better <laughs> um, at all. But if you look at the legalist writings, it's very clear that their concern is, despite everything that was being said by the Confucians and the Taoists, the explicit concern of the legalists is you're not changing society enough that you can cultivate yourself as much as you want to in either a ritual sense or in a Dawa sense, and you're not necessarily going to break down these aristocratic societies. They're being broken down by other technological changes, but people cultivating themselves alone won't do it. The legalist argument is the only way to completely, once and for all, fully wipe out these aristocratic societies is to build institutions absolute, pure, meritocratic institutions, pure bureaucracies, they would call them, and you create bureaucracies in which, ideally, everyone in positions of power gets there only because they're good bureaucrats, exclusively, not because of birth, merit rather than birth. You create these bureaucracies to build effective, powerful states. And why do you build effective, powerful states? To win and become more powerful. Their argument is you need an effective bureaucracy to run mass infantry armies. To run mass infantry armies, you need people well-trained. You need people well-fed. You need incredible agricultural produce. And the only way you're going to do this is by creating powerful bureaucratic states that can build the infrastructure, build the kind of factories, build the kind of training that is necessary to run such a society. And the only people who can run a society so built will be those who are good bureaucrats. And so your goal is break down these aristocratic families, have these states run absolutely everything. They also run a legal system in which everyone, commoner and aristocrat alike, are held to the exact same legal standards. Um, these are ideas we now take for granted, but at the time in world history, these were radical arguments. And the idea is, ultimately, you try to create a purely meritocratic world. But again, unlike the Confucians, you have no interest in a moral world. You have no interest in self-cultivation, creating good people. Here it's a meritocracy aimed exclusively at one thing, building effective states to run effective militaries with effectively run infrastructure in which everyone perfectly plays their larger societal role to create such a world. So, not about morality, certainly not about self-cultivation, but explicitly about once and for all breaking down these earlier Bronze Age aristocratic societies. So, that briefly is now what we see going on with these three views. Having said that, let's take it through very briefly, but tellingly, what's going to happen next. So what happens when these ideas being developed as we're seeing in these bamboo strips begin to take hold? These movements start becoming powerful. Rulers start listening to them. Rulers start beginning to put them into play. And you probably won't be surprised to hear that it sounds like, that it sounds like sound, sound quality is losing again. How about this? Is, is it better if I do it this way? Okay, it sounds like that's a little bit better. Okay, this is a little bit better. So many apologies, but thank you so much for letting me know. Okay, I will move it right here. Okay, good. So it sounds like this is doing a little bit better. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you all so much. So let us now talk about what happens when these ideas are put into play historically. What you're looking at here is, and many of you probably know this, it's one of the terracotta warriors from the first emperor of Qin's tomb. The first emperor is the main 
properly implies is the figure who begins the first empire. This occurs in 221 BCE, and he was not a follower of Confucianism, certainly not of Taoism. He was a follower of legalism, and he was convinced, not as far as we can tell, that Confucianism and Taoism were wrong per se. He seemed, however, to buy very much into the view that they're simply inadequate, and legalism is the one and only way to organize a world. And indeed, from a legalist perspective, Confucians and Taoists can get in the way because they will emphasize these moral ideas for Confucians or Taoists, these visions of harmony that may prevent a state from doing what it needs to do. So the first emperor's vision, in a nutshell, was to once and for all wipe out what he called the traditional world, this world of aristocratic societies, build a perfect military state Confucian scholars would be killed because they believe foolishly in following these old rituals and, and talking about self-cultivation. And the idea was once and for all create this new society that people have now been talking about for two or three centuries. As we know, this failed. So this grand new empire, and I'll show you a few more pictures from it, this grand new empire falls in about 20 years, a disastrous failure. And it's followed by an empire called the Han, H-A-N, an empire that at the time, and again, we can now see easily from excavated texts, was not seen as an empire likely to last very long. On the contrary, the Han lasts for four centuries and really becomes the single most important empire in establishing the political vision underlying all three of these, these ideologies we've been talking about. And the way it does it is essentially by saying the legalists were right. The Qin was right to do what they did. However, the mistake of the first emperor was to get rid of these others, the Confucians and Taoists. And the Han vision in a nutshell was to say, let's bring them all together. Even if they seem contradictory, um, literally so in many cases, um, in the sense that they're actually explicitly attacking each other, in fact, the argument was they're actually combining, which they are combined well, around a very similar set of ideas. And basically the Han vision was to say, let's keep a legalist bureaucracy, a legalist legal system, the entire attempt to create a strong state building massive public infrastructure projects, actively working to build huge, huge um, agricultural products, uh, um, um, projects, dams, canals, roads, all of that we'll maintain. However, what we will do for the bureaucracy is actually define the bureaucracy in Confucian terms. And so, yes, we'll build a meritocracy in legal sense, in other words, an institutionalized bureaucracy, but we will also say it's Confucian criteria that would define if you can gain a position in this bureaucracy. In other words, if you are well-educated, cultivating yourself, those are the people we want in the bureaucracy. If you can get those sorts of people in the bureaucracy, highly educated, cultivating themselves, they will hopefully be good people. And along with the institutional control of a legal state, we will also have a general Confucian vision of a good society run by good, by which they meant self-cultivated, educated people. And even Taoism would come in because the idea is such a society would also be aiming at some kind of a vision of a larger harmony. In other words, we will build a human society based upon these principles of self-cultivation with institutional controls to run them, but also a sense that it should fit in with the larger world. That if we build such a society, we should also be attentive to the larger harmony it can create, or if it's failing to create, then hopefully we will be working to actually create a better world. Now, once this develops, these three ideologies coming together, what you get is something a bit different than what we thought we were seeing, say, 50 years ago. What you actually start getting is, yes, a very effective empire, to say the least, but you get something else, too you get a civilization that, comparatively speaking, was incredibly devoted to these basic ideas of 
education, cultivation, and meritocracy. Now, absolutely, there are extreme limitations that we, looking back now, would see. To begin with, the most obvious, only men could even be considered for a governmental position, so incredible gender inequality. And needless to say, to become educated enough to even begin to have the possibility of making it into <laughs> the bureaucracy, you actually had to have at least enough money to educate your children because you don't have a universal system of education. So incredible limitations. However, comparatively speaking, if you look at, say, what's going on in China versus what's going on in Europe, you see an unbelievable difference. Europe, after this period, after the Roman Empire, roughly the same time as the Han, period, Han Empire, basically returns to rule by aristocratic societies. And that continues basically through the 18th century. So Europe is simply, again, controlled by aristocratic families that control all land and resources. And kingship is simply a question of who is the most powerful aristocratic family. There are states, but they're minimal. You don't have much in terms of bureaucracy, minimal public infrastructure, almost no social mobility. In China, on the contrary, with the huge limitations I've mentioned, you still have at least have ideals of a bureaucracy, building infrastructure, promoting social mobility through education, running a legal system in which commoners and aristocrats were held equally, and it proved to be an incredibly successful system. Incredibly successful in the sense that we are now seeing not only was there an incredible political resurgence of power throughout East Asia, but also an incredible economic growth. Far from limiting the growth of the economy, once you create public infrastructure like this, it's incredibly productive for economic growth. So much so that we're now realizing that much of the world's economy up until basically the 19th century, when everything changes for reasons I'll get to momentarily, Basically, the heart of much of the economic growth of the world was coming from East Asia, and it was directly related to the creation of these huge bureaucratic states, building infrastructure, pushing education, and creating the conditions within which there's at least the possibility for social growth, social mobility, and economic growth as well. Now, if that's the case, needless to say, all of this changes. In the 19th century, the world economy I was just alluding to dramatically changes. Europe at this point literally takes over most of the globe, physically captures most of the economic trade routes that were actually pervading. And I'll just show you a few more pictures from, from early China as I'm speaking here. Um, actively took control of many of the trade routes going out of East Asia and physically conquered much of East Asia as well. And the world, as I say, was changed dramatically. However, I began this talk by mentioning the resurgence, and let me close by mentioning the same. Why is there this huge resurgence? Well, suddenly here we are now, about two centuries after this big change occurred, and unlike the huge change that we thought we were seeing, say, mid 20th century, um, things look a little bit different. And now, the idea of creating a type of a society that would strongly prize education, strongly prize self-cultivation, that would strongly emphasize the public infrastructure as part of the ways in which you try to create a world within which people can grow and develop, and also explicitly focused both in terms of values but also in terms of institutional power on preventing too much control by a wealthy elite of government institutions, but suddenly these ideas that, again, in the 1950s seemed so old-fashioned when they were being read under, under very unfair eyes, to say the least, suddenly a lot of these ideas seem very powerful again. And part of the resurgence now is to say, that not that we'll return to what things were like 2,000 years ago, obviously, but can we actually reintroduce some of these ideas? Can we reintroduce these ideas of education and self-cultivation? Can we actually bring back some of these ideas of how you can build a state that won't be overly controlled by money interests? And if we do so, 
could it possibly turn out to be incredibly productive of economic growth as opposed to being restricted toward it? The answer, at least <laughs> for many people, is maybe so. And hence you're getting a resurgence of all of these ideas, a resurgence both of what they could mean for self-cultivation in daily life and even a resurgence of what it could mean at a state and political level. And suddenly these old ideas seem very, very relevant again. And pushing forward, who knows how this is all going to play out, but I would like to conclude on the following thought. The world our students will be growing up in is a world in which these ideas, unlike the way they were being thought of, say, in the mid-20th century, will be alive again. They will live in a world where everything we just mentioned will be seen as a live option. Whatever happens in China, economic growth, economic collapse, etc., who knows, but whatever happens, these ideas are likely to be alive and part and parcel of the world that they will be thinking about and living with them. And so the more we can do to help them to understand the complexities of these ideas, ideas that, again, I think will be a significant part of the world they will be living in, the more we can do to help them understand these ideas, the better. It is likely they will be among the people actively arguing in different ways. How do we pull together Confucian ideas with visions of democracy, for example? How do we build notions of self-cultivation in with visions of individualism, etc.? All of this, as we hope to move toward a more cosmopolitan world, will be part of the ideas that we'll actively be working with. So let me simply end by saying to all of you, thank you. Um, what you are doing is incredibly important the more we can do to help our students understand these ideas and why they're alive and why they're likely to be ever the more so over the decades to come, the more I think we will help to contribute to a world in which they can flourish because they will be able to deal with these ideas, argue with them, wrestle with them, and the degree to which they do is the degree to which they are likely to be able to play a significant role in whatever world will be emerging out of this, I think, very exciting cosmopolitan moment. So thank you all very much. Okay, so now let's turn it over to Todd. You're going to turn on your microphone, Todd? Good. I will turn it on. Um, if folks can let me know if you can hear me clearly, that would be terrific. Uh, you don't even have to type. Underneath your name, there's a little emoji. You can just hit the thumbs up if that works, and, and that's great. I'll try and keep myself moving here. Um, I want to say definitely a big thank you to Peter and to Primary Source. Um, for having me on tonight. It's always a pleasure to work with Primary Source, and I'm glad it looks like people can hear me. So I'll try and keep the same volume, and I will ditch the additional microphone. Um, tonight I want to give you some uh, examples of how I've used Chinese philosophy in my world history classes. I am a high school history teacher, so these are things that I've done in World 1, World 2, and AP World. I think they can be scaled um, up or down in, in whatever direction, depending on the needs of your classroom. I would say, though, as a caveat, I don't know that elementary school would necessarily work, um, but if you've got ideas, I'm, I'm happy to mull them over. Uh, and then a lot of these ideas I've also shared via Twitter. If you follow the hashtag SSChat or hashtag WorldChat, um, some of these may not be all that fresh because they've been out and about. Uh, I have links in the presentation that I don't think will work, um, but I will just share the documents that I've linked to with, with Peter and Stephanie, and hopefully they can push them out um, to all of you guys so you can, you can see them on your own. Um, if you've got questions as we go, feel free to stick them in the chat box. Perfect. That's great. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, and I'm happy to, to address them. I know we have a Q&A at the end, but if there's anything that comes up that's pressing, feel free to write it in the chat box, and, and I'll see it and, and try and address it as I go along. All right, and then let's get going. So I'm going to start you with uh, my summative activity, and I like to take a lot of this stuff and make it um, as relevant to today's world as possible. So this is an activity where I ask students to either use a Google Doc if you have access to that, or they can do it on big paper. But I would assign a group of three students, each a role, so one kid gets Confucius, one kid gets Lao Tzu, and the other gets Han Fei Tzu. They then draw a current issue out of a hat. Uh, so that could be anything from global warming to uh, the Ebola virus spreading to um, conflict anywhere around the world. 
they are to then set up a dialogue in which the three thinkers happen to walk into a Starbucks and run into each other. They get a latte or an appropriate drink, depending on their philosophy, and they sit down and they have to talk about this. I have several requirements that they have to make three references to their uh, actual work. They have to quote themselves in, in that process. Uh, and then they each have to speak a requisite number of times. Usually my students really end up enjoying this. They get to use a lot of imagination. They get to tie and try and pull um, some creativity into it. As I said, it is a summative, though. This is after you've done everything else. So I'll, I'll begin with the ending. That seems like a nicely Taoist idea. When I'm introducing the Analects right now, being an election season, it's the perfect time to do it. Um, I have uh, my students read the selection that Stephanie just posted this link to. So I've compiled a whole bunch of, of portions of the Analects from all throughout it over the years that all have to do with how a leader should behave, how a leader should make decisions, um, and then they get to pick a candidate. I usually will have kids work um, maybe in pairs, maybe individually, depending on the size of the class. But their task is to pick a presidential candidate, any candidate, and then use the intellects to give that candidate advice on how to be a good leader, how to present themselves to the American voters if the American voters were um, Confucian. Usually I'm looking for a three-slide presentation, a three-slide PowerPoint, or again, they can also do this on individual sheets of paper where they're, they're limited to the number of words they can use. I also have modified this in non-election years to the current sitting president and a particular topic that the president has to deal with. Uh, but they do get a pretty good sense of what I call the fussiness of Confucianism and the propriety that is about Confucianism. Um, they would have a, a terrific time with Donald Trump and trying to figure out how to, how to be civil uh, is an interesting side effect of this particular activity. Taoism I find to be one of the toughest things for my students to get a hold of, partly because, you know, paradox and the high school minds sometimes don't blend very well together. Um, the link is again to a, a bunch of selections from the Tao Te Ching. Um, and they're all about the major ideas in Taoism. So there's a selection there about the uncarved block. There's a selection there about effortless action. There's a selection there about the Tao itself and, and, and what it is and isn't. And their task is to take that selection and then and draw it, basically put it into either a collage of images or a single image. They can draw it. They can you know, use clip art. They can print stuff out, cut and paste, whatever they like. Um, that they believe these images represent what the what the Tao Te Ching is talking about in their selection. The kids then do a gallery walk. They post their images around the room. If you're using small paper, then I usually will give my students uh, a couple of post-it notes. If you're using big paper in their space, then they can just take their pens. But their task is to try and write on the paper what the concept is. So if they're looking at this picture and they think that it's demonstrating effortless action, then they would write effortless action. And they basically vote. And so the students get a chance to see uh, and get some feedback on how clearly they've represented the ideas. We then have the opportunity to, to look at particular pictures and talk about some of these concepts um, as they've tried to make them far more concrete. This is tough. This is, this is, it's fun. My students love walking around. They like drawing. Uh, but it's also, some of these are, are intellectually challenging for some of these kids. So it proves to be a little bit more difficult than they think. I like the drawing part of it, though, because it does allow them to do more than just read and annotate, which um, can not always illuminate what they think it's about. Legalism is probably the easiest thing for, for my students to get. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, power is what matters and do it my way or I kill you is how one of my students described it earlier. Um, this, so this is, I, and again, these, these readings are selections um, from the Han Feidza and they, uh, I usually have kids work individually for this one because they don't really need the benefit of another person, but I ask them to pretend that they are the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Uh, I give them topics that Congress is currently struggling with, and their task is to compose a couple paragraphs uh, up to, you know, a three-paragraph essay about how they would put legalism in action to resolve whatever the congressional deadlock is. 
uh, that leads to all sorts of a, a bloodbath, which may be cathartic for dealing with uh, current frustrations about Congress, but also allows the students to, to again, put it into action um, and apply it in a modern context. They pretty quickly realize that legalist government is not one that they want to live under, which I think is probably good. So I will also run a Socratic seminar with my class or even a, um, a fishbowl conversation because I find that one of the things my students gravitate to is this idea of the inherent goodness of people. Um, and all three philosophies really do speak to that to, to greater or lesser extents. And my students really love talking about this. I, my juniors especially will, will roll around with this conversation for a long time. But I basically put them in, in the conversation, in the discussion, um, and we first ask, you know, what do you think people are? Do you think people have the capacity to improve? Do you think people are who they are? Are they static beings? And then I introduce Mencius by giving um, his famous example of people are, of course, inherently good for if you were walking down the street and saw a child about to fall into a well, you would want to aid that child and prevent that tragedy from happening. And then I basically say, agree or disagree with that statement. Do you believe people have that capacity? Uh, and the conversation then pretty much takes off from there. Uh, there is almost always one student in my room who steadfastly maintains that he or she would not do anything to help that child. He would walk on by. And that invariably causes his peers to turn on uh, him or her. Um, so again, as a, just a, a discussion prompt, um, the modern American uh, view of what's appropriate and what's not around children comes into play, and there are lots of different ways that you can demonstrate how Mencius kind of adds flesh to a lot of Confucius's earliest ideas in the Analects. I really like these books. Unfortunately, I find that students don't know Winnie the Pooh anymore, which is maybe an American tragedy. Uh, there are lots of problems from a scholarly point of view with both the Tao of Pooh and the Tao of Piglet. I, don't, I think that he sometimes wanders maybe more than some people would be comfortable with from the root of Taoism. But uh, as a read-along activity, it's a great way to introduce uh, a lot of the concepts of Taoism to high school kids through Winnie the Pooh. He makes the, uh, I guess I'll call it the argument, but he says that Pooh is the uncarved block. He is simple. Um, without being stupid, but he's, he's just a very, very humble bear. Uh, and then you have Owl, who is wise, and you have Rabbit, who has a brain, and you have Eeyore, who's gloomy. Um, you get Winnie the Pooh and the story of uh, when he and Piglet are lost in the woods, um, Pooh just stops thinking uh, and then finds his way home when he stops trying to find his way home. So both have great, I, I do them as story time. I have the kids sit in a circle. I open up the book and I read a couple of selections. Um, but again, they, they don't really even know Winnie the Pooh in, in video form. So there's a little bit of backfill that I had to do this year, so I probably will not use these guys again, which is, is kind of sad. And then lastly, if you have access to Twitter uh, or your students do in the classroom, I, I like to use um, Twitter as a way to deal with vocabulary. So I will introduce the vocabulary of all three of the philosophies. I do this with, uh, with, with the Indian traditions as well, um, where the students, I have a hashtag, just usually Taoism, um, and then the students have to tweet what I call a near definition. So they get the word, the Tao, and they have to come up with their own words for it. And then they have to find an image and attach the image to uh, the, tweet, the tweet and then send it off into the universe. We then compile them all into uh, one location um, and then people can go from there. So a quick look at some activities for you all there. Peter, I think I'll okay. hand it over well, to you. It looks like we already have a question coming in on the in the chat box, and people should also feel free to raise their virtual hand, which is up under their their name. There's a hand, and if you want to, you know, ask your question um, verbally rather than write it, that's also more than welcome. Um, I guess the first question comes from Angela, who's basically asking about um, what happened to these philosophies under uh, Mao and during the uh, communist rule in China. And why is there a resurgence of interest in Chinese philosophy now? So that sounds like a pretty big question, but let's see what you have to say, Michael. 
Absolutely. So first, a huge thanks to Todd. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. And Angela, great question. So intriguingly, when Mao comes to power, Mao compared himself to the first emperor. And Mao's argument was the basic difference, in fact, he even said the only difference was his word, between the first emperor and himself is that he was going to really do it fully and the first emperor wasn't strong enough, which is an amazing statement to make. But what he meant was the first emperor was trying to wipe out an aristocratic world once and for all. Mao's vision was he failed um, and foolishly, in Mao's opinion, allowed things like Confucianism and Taoism to come back. And Mao's idea was he was going to wipe all of this out once and for all. So in his mind, Mao's I mean, even things like Confucianism and Taoism were overly elitist, even if their intent was to create a world where people would be so cultivated and educated. Mao's vision was, yes, but only really the elite could gain access to this education, and therefore it didn't really do enough to destroy these aristocratic societies. So getting back to your question, Angela, Mao basically said all of this, everything we've mentioned should be destroyed. So literally these books were burned, um, which is what the first emperor did, so directly modeling himself on the first emperor. These ideas should be destroyed, and we should create a radically new world that would be a truly equal and open society, um, in his reading, therefore, a communist society, completely wiping out all class differences, so fully wiping out these aristocratic worlds completely. Um, in the aftermath of that, Mao was seen as a failure in a lot of this. Um, successful in creating a new world in China, but, but unsuccessful in his goals. And then for a while, you had the emergence of a push in China toward almost the most extreme form of neoliberal capitalism you can imagine, um, much more so actually than, than in America. And so China gradually became a world that um, where kind of everything was up for sale, um, where everything was sort of laissez-faire capitalism. And what's intriguing now, and I mean now literally within the past, say, about eight years, now you're getting this incredible resurgence in China of an interest in these older ideas, and as well as everything else, too. Um, and what's driving it is a concern in China that people will talk about very openly in the blogosphere, that um, we have lost our values, that we've lost our values, that we've become a society where everything is up for sale, and we again need to find our values. And so in this is a huge resurgence of these earlier ideas. Um, in this also is a huge um, push toward um, Christianity. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very exciting moment in China where these older ideas as well as ideas from around the world are suddenly being debated again and hotly debated. And again, how well of this will play out, I have no idea. But Getting back to your question, Angela, this is why these ideas are suddenly coming back to life again. Suddenly there's a sense that maybe these ideas are relevant toward problems we're currently facing, and they may indeed give us a very strong sense of how to become better people, and even how to begin to once again tackle what would seem to be insoluble governing problems around the world, in the sense that maybe there's something to learn from these old teachings. So it's a very, very exciting moment. Great question. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have a question and want to raise their hand or to or ask it directly? Um, I was wondering, Michael, if you could just say a little bit more about some of the um, topics that you found work particularly well with either your students or you think might work well with um, you know, other people's younger students, uh, high school or middle school or even elementary. Yes, I, I think Todd's discussion here is brilliant, and this is exactly what I find works in the classroom as well. So I find the more we can do to make it clear to students that these are alive ideas. So as Todd was saying, what would he say you know, about a contemporary election issue? Um, the more we can do that, the more alive these ideas become. And the reason this is so important is that's how these ideas always work in Chinese history. Um, always. I mean, you would never read the Analects and 
and well, you could read the Analects and think what life was like back in, in 5th century BCE, but, but it was treated as a live living philosophy, which meant you're always trying to bring these ideas to the present. So absolutely, the more we can do exactly along the lines of what Todd was saying, the more we can bring these ideas to life for our students, and that's precisely how one best lives up to these ideas. I mean, that these ideas are supposed to be guiding ideas for how we live our lives. And so yes, I found precisely doing what Todd does, um, bring up very contemporary issues and talk through what it would mean to follow a Confucian way of thinking, a Taoist way of thinking, a legalist way of thinking, and working through these problems. And it gives students immediately a sense that these are living ideas that give real alternatives to visions they would otherwise accept. Oh, and I see I also have a question from Sarah. Thank you so much. And so Sarah's question is, um, is a lot of this rereading of the tradition coming from these archaeological excavations? Um, yes. <laughs> so what I was showing in these slides were actual bamboo strips. And what we're discovering um, is, and I should mention, these are found in tombs. So there was a custom in China, wonderful for us, that when someone would pass away, you would bury things associated with them in life. So you would bury furniture, clothing, and if they had a library, you would bury the library. So now we are uncovering incredible numbers of texts. Um, literally, the corpus in my lifetime will probably at least quadruple, maybe be 10 times the number of texts that, that we had when I began my career. And getting to your question, Sarah, yes, it's leading to a fundamental rethinking of most of what we thought about the intellectual life of early China. And suddenly we're realizing it's a world of intense debate, um, very actively debating how we can create a better world, better human beings, um, and we're getting just a total rereading of, of what we thought we knew about the entire tradition. So it's a very exciting moment, as I mentioned right now in China, as ideas are coming back to life. It's also a very exciting moment because these ideas from the ancient period are literally being we thought too, as we're literally excavating them. So it's a perfect moment where these ideas are coming back to life and even in a very literal sense, the texts are coming back to life. So great question, thank you. Rest this, but I think there's still some um, desire to have you kind of address the relationship between legalism and Confucianism because obviously, uh, you're kind of reinterpreting it from the way that most of us um, traditionally learned about it. Yes, thank you. Yes, Carol, I just saw your question. Thank you so much. And indeed, and let me immediately say, both of them at the time certainly thought they were antithetical. <laughs> and so certainly the Confucian emphasis on education and moral self-cultivation, um, the legalist thought this was just horrible. And the legalist view was, no, 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 we want to create an institutional state. And people who are trying to train themselves to be good are very unlikely to follow the necessities of, <laughs> of an institutional state. And so legalists literally wanted to kill Confucians. I mean, quite literally. So the first emperor putting together a legal state was literally killing Confucians. Um, and so incredible antipathy. Um, however, indeed, what we're now discovering is that for that huge antipathy, um, both did see a common problem, which is why later they can be brought together. And that common problem both of them saw was that they had to find ways to destroy what they felt to be these very rigid social hierarchies, which were basically running all of society. And this is true at a larger level. So literally these aristocratic families, which were collapsing, but still you know, very much controlled most of the land but also even beyond those overt powers that, that the aristocracy held, there's a sense of, from both that the values of society were still based in these rigid social hierarchies. And both saw that as the problem. Now they had radically different solutions. The Confucian response was, how do we actually then encourage a meritocracy through education and self-cultivation that would hopefully destroy these older aristocratic values and these rigid social hierarchies, whereas the legalist response was, well, let's create a bureaucracy that will kill the aristocracy and, and kill the Confucians too, and create a completely um, power-based bureaucracy 
on meritocracy, but not based upon education and self-cultivation, but simply upon how good you are in following the state. Um, but again, for all of those differences, which are huge, given that they saw a common problem, this is why the Han Dynasty could pull these together. And at the time, and both the Confucians and legal stuff was insane <laughs> to, to try to draw these ideas together. But the reason they could was that they had that common concern. And in practice, these two seemingly radically different ways of thinking work surprisingly well. And once you, you reconceptualize the bureaucracy as being a place that where it would ideally house self-cultivated, good, well-educated people, suddenly you've got this molding of these two radically different philosophies which did share a common concern. So again, great question. Thank you. We're getting towards the end, so I'm going to just mention three questions, Michael, and you can respond briefly to all of them or to one of them. Um, one question was just, you know, why didn't you deal with Buddhism at all? Um, another one yeah. was kind of, um, is there a revival of legalism going on in China now? And the third one was just a, a more um, request for uh, you to suggest some source or two where we might read more about kind of the reinterpretations that you've been presenting of Chinese philosophies? Yes, all, all great questions. And actually, let me begin with the second one, which will actually, in an ironic way, help with the first as well. So there is indeed a resurgence of legalism, too. Um, and the resurgence of legalism is taking the form of saying um, very much antithetical to a lot of the, the contemporary political theory that's dominant in America. Um, maybe we need strong states. Maybe we need strong states with a strong bureaucracy that will focus on building public infrastructure, um, running huge legal systems, um, trying to confront larger problems that, that businesses cannot confront. And so you're getting a resurgence of the idea um, that really has been kind of pushed aside in America now for a few decades, that big government is actually potentially not only good, but even necessary. And a lot of these, are, these ideas are being traced back to legalism, and, and quite properly so. I mean, legalism, of course, was all about strong states, strong bureaucracies, massive, huge public infrastructure projects. And China, there's a big push in China toward doing exactly that. Um, at a moment, of course, when in America, there's the strong push toward small government, um, um, almost no public infrastructure being paid for um, at the federal level. And so down the road, it's likely that you're going to have two very different visions of governance emerging. And yes, part of that does come from the legacy of legalism in China. Um, now, turning quickly to Buddhism, um, indeed, it, one of the intriguing things about Buddhism when it comes into China is Buddhism becomes Chinese. Um, we often refer to it as Chinese Buddhism. And the reason is because it's a very different animal than, than what we can now trace to be the original ideas coming out of India. And once it comes into China, it becomes very much intermixed with all that we've been mentioning. Um, Buddhism really becomes part and parcel of these ideas of, of individual growth, individual salvation. Um, it actually was, was sort of domesticated into a way that worked extremely well with Confucianism and Taoism. Um, even to the point, just to give a concrete example, where, for example, if someone were to pass away and I would have a funeral, you would actually bring in, often both a Taoist priest and a Buddhist priest, um, who would actually be able to work together and would see ultimately, if you ask them you know, <laughs> their ultimate visions of the world, you would see discrepancies that had no problem working together because by that point the ideas were so similar. So, yeah, the reason I didn't mention Buddhism explicitly is, although it's fascinating, it actually becomes part of this general mix that comes together um, such that Buddhism becomes sort of a, a yet another um, part of this, this general weave that really didn't create a radical break with what we've been discussing. So very intriguing. Um, and then the final question about places to look for this new excavation, I mean, these, these new readings of the material. Sadly, there's not yet a really good single work. Um, literally, these ideas are being translated and interpreted as we speak. But I would say within the next probably at least two to three years, there should hopefully be good readable things in English that would lay out a lot of the differences. 
the good news, however, because that's like the like bad news that one has to wait. The good news is, as I always tell my students, those who of course, don't know classical Chinese and can't yet read these, these works until they're translated, the good news is a lot of what's going on is it's forcing us to reread a lot of these old received texts. So the Analects, the Bao de Jing. And as I tell my students, basically if you go back and reread the texts, um, not through the lens that we used to read them, as these sort of old traditional ideas that, <laughs> that were trying to keep people down, but actually read the text in terms of what they're actually saying and do exactly the things that Todd was recommending. Ask students to actually say, what would it mean today to put these into practice? You actually do get a lot of what we're now finding through our excavations. So in part, simply reading these old texts again, but without the, <laughs> the lenses that we've been reading them, you actually get a lot of what we're now finding in, in these new excavations as well. So the good news is the material in that sense is already available to the students because you really see it in these texts. It's just that we've been missing it because we had this very dangerous narrative about the traditional world that was leading us to actually miss a lot of what was actually physically in front of us. So great question. Thank you. Okay. I'd like to thank uh, Michael and Todd once again for their presentations and also all the participants who um, participated with us in this uh, webinar today and encourage them to uh, you know, keep in touch with Primary Source through email, Facebook, uh, Twitter, or our website. And I particularly wanted to bring to your attention um, two programs this summer. One is an online course on uh, modern China, and the other is actually a face-to-face -face summer institute on culture and nature in Japan, which is being underwritten by the U.S. Japan Foundation so that we have um, a lot of funding to um, help defray the cost to educators. So I, you know, I hope you will look at the website and see if either of these courses would be something you would be interested in participating in. So I want to um, once again thank the participants. Thank you for educating our children, and good night.